Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship Journey webinar. My name is Dorothy Hanna and I am the program administrator for the CAXT MIT Ibn Khaldun Fellowship for Saudi Arabian Women. In this evening's agenda, we will begin with an introduction of our sponsor, CAXT, by uh, Dr. Malak Al Thagafi. After that, we will have a presentation about how to apply for the program. And finally, Dr. Donna and Dr. Sara will speak about their experiences as IBK fellows. Uh, at this time, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Malak Al Thagafi. She is the CAT General Director of the General Directorate for National RDI Coordination. And she is going to give us an overview of CAST and the IBK program. And I see a message that people are having trouble hearing. Um, can my fellow panelists at least hear us, hear me? No, I can able to hear you well. Great. So uh, Dr. Malak, please go ahead and uh, share with us about CAST. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dorsey, for the introduction and giving us the floor to talk a little bit about CATS. I will, I will uh, try uh, not to take a lot from your time because I'm sure people are more interested to know about the fellowship itself. So CATS uh, established in 1977. It is uh, functioning since then as a National Science Foundation for Saudi Arabia. And uh, in CACS, we believe that scientific research and technological developments are key component to further economic growth and national development in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And what we do, we do operate and manage the following activities. We support the national research uh, uh, and, and scientific research and development uh, innovation strategies. We work, uh, we plan, uh, prepare and plan the national plans for science, technology and innovation. And we work, work also with the National Industrial Development Logistics Program, NIDLIP, and with other many entity. We do uh, serve three areas. Uh, in the research, we do uh, provide funding uh, for university research centers in the kingdom. And we also do give technological support. CAX has its own uh, research institutes uh, in wide spectrum of area, uh, atomic energy to uh, energy to space, astronomy, at life science and environmental, etc. And under, under all of the, each institute, there is multiple centers of that specialize in specific area of a whole spectrum of the innovation um, ecosystem. What we also uh, do, we give technical support to the kingdom. For example, we are give the internet service to the Saudi Research Innovation Network Marine, technical services, electronic, etc. And uh, we also function in CACs in, in development. So we implement a development program in 15 uh, vital sectors that contribute to economic growth and sustainability. And uh, finally, what we do, we also support the innovation by supporting on uh, developing industrial innovation centers programs and enhancing the work of business incubators, accelerator and destiny 4.0 programs. And CAX was take one of the leader in the kingdom to have the joint center of excellences with the world leading universities, including MIT, uh, Stanford, uh, along with other. And in Boston area also we have with Brigham and Women and for the center of biomedicine. Uh, IBK is uh, one of the special program tax uh, sponsored because in tax uh, we believe in uh, in empowering in, as a science empowerment for everyone and in Saudi Arabia specifically we know that Saudi women has uh, they are a leader in the field of science because actually that was a statistic to us over 60 percent of our uh, university graduate is measuring in some sort on the science or health uh, um, uh, measure. So CACS took over the sponsorship of this program and we're happening to do this and working on uh, uh, working with MIT to uh, train the next generation of the Saudi uh, women scientists in a different area of system. Thank you. Thank you 
you very much, Dr. Malak, and we're really grateful to have us here with you to eat this evening um, and grateful to have CAXT as our sponsor. Uh, at this time, we're going to present how you can apply. Um, and we have a slideshow. And uh, we'll begin with Professor Kamal Yusuf Toomey, and then the rest of the IBK team will also present some information about how to apply for the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship. So please go ahead, Professor Kamal. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dorothy. Uh, so in this uh, presentation, uh, a brief presentation, we'll be covering a little bit about the program history. Uh, also, we cover some information about MIT, the, uh, the benefits uh, that are coming with the, with the fellowship, uh, the program also has some different activities that will be presented as part of this uh, um, uh, uh, discussion. Uh, and then at the end, uh, we will cover the life at MIT and in the Boston uh, area. And then, you know, the most important part will be about uh, how to apply to this, uh, to the Ibn Khaldun uh, program. <clears throat> Next. So the, uh, the, this uh, program was established uh, uh, by the MIT KFUPM collaboration that started in 2008. Uh, and that collaboration focused on the uh, water research and, uh, and energy. And I'm sure most of you remember that at that time, KFUPM was all men uh, at the university. There were no women. And, uh, and so MIT uh, kind of made a, a requirement that for this uh, collaboration to, uh, to proceed, you know, in a, um, let's say, more successful way, that uh, the Saudi women should be also part, you know, of, this, uh, of that collaboration. And that's how the Ibn Khaldun uh, program was uh, generated. And it was until 2012 uh, that we admitted the two fellows at that time. Um, and then uh, Saudi Aramco, and of course, with the uh, um, uh, big help of uh, Khaled Fel at that time, who was the CEO of uh, Aramco company, that they moved the program from uh, Kenya. Actually, it was uh, you know to, to, to Aramco for about five years, and the agreement that started in 2013. And at that time, we went like from two. Uh, fellows to about 10 or maximum of 10, which was a big boost uh, to the program and to our activities. Next. Um, and so uh, in, in 2018, uh, Amir Muhammad visited MIT at that time. And then uh, there was uh, a, a move, you know, to host uh, the program uh, and move it from Aramco to, uh, to CAXT. And at that time, also the uh, uh, a 10-year program, you know, was signed on agreement between CAXT and uh, uh, and MIT. Uh, and so for that phase, you know, with CAXT, the new fellows that we received were in January 2019. And you can see in the picture uh, our president uh, Rafael Weif and uh, with the Prince uh, Turkey, who was at that time uh, the president uh, uh, of CAXT. I must mention that uh, people who worked you know in the background and make all of this uh, you know possible you know prince uh, uh, turkey who was president as i mentioned also uh, 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 dr enes Ferris, you know who uh, was vice president at that time at cax and is now the current uh, president uh, of cax and we thank all of them you know for helping you know with this uh, program and i should not forget uh, uh, dr uh, uh, Khaled Sultan, who was uh, president, you know, of KFUPM uh, uh, when the program was established. Next, yes. So, so the Ibn Khaldun program is only one of these uh, collaboration between MIT 
uh, and uh, so in the kingdom. And so the, the slide shows uh, a few other programs, the Center for Complex uh, Engineering System, and this is also between MIT and CACS, and I am the co-director of that uh, center. Uh, the other ones are the Ibn Lat uh, Abdul Latif uh, uh, Jamil uh, World Water and Food Security Lab, or JWAFs, uh, another program on uh, poverty and, and action, uh, another one is on the Clinic for uh, Machine Learning and Health. Uh, these are all sponsored or under the umbrella of uh, Abdul Latif uh, Jamil. Um, and of course, before that, uh, we had the Clean Water and Clean Energy Center between MIT and KFUPN. Next one. Um, so uh, the MIT uh, upper administration, uh, you know, uh, very, very supportive, you know, of this, uh, uh, of, of the program and also all of the activities that we have. And we would like to share with you the um, uh, statement by uh, our uh, associate provost, uh, uh, Professor Philip uh, Hori. Everything I know from the reports of that set of collaborations has been excellent really first rate and we're so grateful to have these new kinds of collaborations at and with our MIT at MIT and with our faculty um, let me just say on behalf of the senior administration of MIT we feel privileged to be part of this program I, I really mean that most sincerely this is a breakthrough program for MIT I'd like to think for Saudi Arabia as well I certainly hope so but we're, we're privileged we're honored to have you Yes. Yeah, and I, yeah, and I think I would like to add uh, to what uh, uh, Professor Huri just mentioned that I don't know of any other program in the world that is uh, designed specifically for uh, women, you know, in uh, some country of this uh, of this type and also of this uh, magnitude. Next one. So each one of the fellows that come to MIT, of course, they will be working in uh, a lab, you know, with the, uh, their uh, professor, uh, who he or she is the direct uh, supervisor. But at the same time, there are many other uh, labs and, um, uh, and resources at MIT that will be available uh, to, the, uh, to the fellows. Uh, this uh, slide shows on the left-hand side, the MIT Nano, this is a new, a building that was uh, uh, opened in uh, October of 2018, and it hosts uh, many um, uh, activities, instrumentation, uh, labs, and so on, all for the in the nano uh, area. And also, the slides has a whole list of uh, uh, other uh, laboratories uh, that uh, in different uh, different areas, uh, from the uh, uh, medical, biomedical. Uh, chemistry, data, uh, fabrication with the 3D printing, maker spaces, uh, materials, clean rooms, so a whole variety of labs that uh, are available and the fellows will benefit from them. Next slide. Yeah, and uh, so MIT, you know, we are very productive in terms of, um, you know, the uh, uh, patents. Uh, we do at least uh, like one patent every other day. Uh, and also, most importantly, you know, the companies that are launched, you know, uh, and using the licenses uh, from, uh, uh, from MIT. So there are uh, maybe more than 100 uh, uh, additional companies that, that have been uh, formed, uh, you know, based on the research activities and the licenses of, this, uh, of the technologies. Next slide. And the, uh, when you are at MIT, so there's a whole uh, ecosystem uh, around uh, uh, MIT, and uh, this slide shows the different um, uh, types of uh, activities. For example, uh, companies that Saudi Aramco, who has a, a, a research and development center just a walking distance uh, from uh, MIT, is in green. Uh, in uh, orange, uh, IT and uh, data, uh, so there is Akamai and uh, uh, Twitter, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, so a lot of the big companies and famous ones are, uh, are there. Um, and also other companies that are the uh, venture uh, capital 
type of uh, companies. Um, and then you can see that the, uh, the, the bulk of the companies is also in the bio uh, uh, technologies and bio uh, related uh, uh, activities, research and development, and all of these are, uh, are in blue. This is very, very important to have the university, the campus, and then surrounded by all these important uh, companies. You have the combination of the talent and all of these resources, and most importantly, the proximity that you can just walk you know, to any one of these uh, places, you know, these all facilitate and help, you know, the discovery, the innovation, the entrepreneurship, and also the bringing, you know, these resources, uh, the capital and other things that are uh, needed, you know, to, uh, to make uh, these activities very uh, fruitful. Uh, so I'll uh, stop now and then uh, give the floor to Teresa Worth, uh, who is uh, our program uh, manager, um, Teresa. Great. Thank you, Kamal, and welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, as Dorothy mentioned, I'm Teresa Wirth. I'm the program manager of Ibn Khaldun Fellowship. I've been working with the program since about 2013. It's the first year in a long time that I have not visited Saudi Arabia, and I'm missing you all and glad that you can be here today with me in Waltham, Massachusetts. <laughs> so please allow me to continue with our presentation. Um, so very generally, what is the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship? It is a postdoc fellowship for Saudi Arabian women with research as the central goals of the program. So the opportunity here is to collaborate with an MIT professor and his or her research group uh, with access to the facilities, as Kamal mentioned, and also professional development opportunities to supplement your time here at MIT. Um, I think just before we move on to the next slide, one thing I just want to add to Kamal's comment about the ecosystem, in addition to having quite a lot of companies and other industry nearby, there are also a lot of other universities and the academic community in Boston generally is very um, thriving. So there's a lot of opportunities um, to explore your field and your professional development while you're here. So if we can move to the next slide, I'll continue to tell you a little bit more about that. Um, so the goals of our program really are to en enable Saudi PhDs to conduct research at MIT. Um, and I say at MIT because we often get the question if people can work at other universities. Um, this is the MIT program to work with MIT. MIT faculty. So if you are looking at research groups that you might be interested in, um, do make sure they're at MIT. There are a lot of collaborative programs with other universities, and sometimes it's not as clear as you'd think. <laughs> um, so with this program, we're hoping to support this generation of Saudi women um, to expose them to MIT's research, um, teaching, and business practices. Um, to continue to improve the research environment in Saudi Arabia, to do our part um, to help um, the students and faculty um, at your various universities and institutions. Um, blocking my slide a little bit here. Um, we're also um, actively working to develop a cohort of fellow of former fellows and support the community of, of um, women who have gone through this program and their contributions to the Kingdom's Knowledge Society. Um, we really believe that um, with this, especially with this new effort with Vision 2020, that um, the time is so fruitful for women to take their place in this kingdom more so than in the past, and we're proud to support that. Um, and finally, um, we believe at MIT that collaboration really improves research and improves outcomes. And through this program, we hope to um, continue to build communication and collaboration between MIT and Saudi researchers to that end. Next slide. So I work in the Department of Mechanical Engineering, as do my colleagues, Nadia, Kamal, and Dorothy. But this program is uh, broad across MIT. So um, if you were to apply to this program, you could work in bio, in aeroastro, in the media lab, in chemical engineering. Um, any program at MIT where there's a professor doing active research Research is a viable field for the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship as well. We're always happy to add to this list. So this is not a, a finite list. <laughs> Next slide. 
Um, so to date, just to give you a sense of the scope of our program, we've welcomed 38 fellows to campus um, and we'll be inviting a few more next year, five fellows for 2021. Um, from that output, we've been proud to see 108 publications and journals and conferences, seven patents issued and three filed, which is a huge accomplishment. So we've been very happy to see that working at MIT has really furthered those professional goals of our fellows. Next slide. So we really feel like there are several areas of um, professional development that the program supports women in improving in and further improving in because our fellows often come with very um, a very high level of experience. So what can we offer? Um, in, in order to further their careers. So joint with research with the MIT professor is the heart of the program. Um, we often see that fellows are able to publish those results in collaboration with faculty in leading journals and conferences, um, access to our facilities, but also working and networking with a wide variety of leaders. So although you might be working in an individual lab at MIT, the MIT environment and the academic envi environment in Boston is very collaborative. And so you have an opportunity to network with quite a large number of people in your fields and in related fields. Um, and you know, we see this as a fruitful opportunity to continue to develop in a research career. Next slide. Um, MIT feels that uh, uh, professional development in many areas is important to the growth of a researcher, either in academia and in industry or in government labs. So um, the fellowship opportunity also um, allows fellows to take advantage of several of the uh, professional development opportunities at MIT and locally in the Boston area. Um, so, the first is just the academic environment in general. Um, there are seminars happening all the time, both at MIT, at Harvard, at Northeastern, at BU, all these universities that when you're here, it's very easy to access them. Access them. Boston's not a very big city, so it's very easy to go and meet with all these different people. Um, so we have a lot of different opportunities for seminars, workshops, conferences that are hosted in the area. Um, MIT also has a professional education program that covers both soft skills such as leadership and project management, these types of things, but also will do short courses in a variety of technical topics that, um, you know, even our faculty and postdocs um, engage with because of the content. Um, Many of our fellows have gone through the Sloan Executive Education programs. They offer certificates in a wide variety of topics primarily um, associated to management and leadership for um, the research and technology leader. Um, so as a Ibn Khaldun fellow, you actually have access to those courses and um, access to um, MIT employee discount on those prices. Um, so furthermore, um, we ha have the opportunity here for fellows to sit in on MIT classes. This either could be because you want to develop a skill for yourself, it's a new area for yourself, or if you are either working in higher education currently or interested in working in higher education, it's an opportunity to see how an MIT professor presents that material and perhaps to get good ideas. So um, a number of reasons why that might be really useful for you in your career. Next slide. Um, this is my, I, you might actually be able to see this better than when I present in person because I know there's a lot going on here. One of the things that we really are proud of with this program is that our fellows after having this experience have had significant opportunities in their careers. Um, either moving to, to a full professor if they're at a university, which I understand at any university is very difficult, um, but also moving into ministry positions, um, dean, vice dean, provost level 
positions at their universities. Um, we have fellows who've been appointed to international committees with the World Health Organization, etc. cetera. Um, so this slide is my opportunity to brag a little bit about our fellows. I really think that um, they've taken this opportunity and really applied it to, to a high level to their careers. Um, and I, I think that speaks to the blended opportunity of both working on research and working on professional development in the MIT context. So um, next slide. Um, I, not every fellow who comes to MIT is pursuing the academic route, although many of them do. Um, but so those of you who are either interested in faculty role in the future or um, currently working in a university, there are um, several opportunities um, that could help you in your teaching as well. Um, MIT has a Kaufman Teaching Certificate, um, which is actually developed for our postdocs and graduate students to help them develop teaching skills for when they enter academia, um, recognizing that doing research in a lab all day does not teach you how to be a teacher. Um, it's a very intensive program that's offered free to any postdoc fellow and many of our um, former fellows have taken that opportunity. Um, some of our fellows have actually gotten, gotten involved in delivering coursework, um, teaching, co-teaching with their faculty um, uh, advisors. Um, Asma al-Sharif and Malak al-Nori notably um, took this opportunity um, to really get in detail with um, the content that their faculty were offering so that they could bring it back to their university. Um, and another thing that's um, an interesting opportunity at MIT that I don't think is available at every university is that um, in the research that you're actually doing um, as your project, we have a very streamlined opportunity to be able to hire undergraduate students to help you with that work. Um, so you can put together a set of targeted objectives and hire a student to work with you um, on that project. So it's a nice opportunity to work on mentoring and teaching skills as well. And I'm sure Kamal will, would chime in just to say that MIT students um, are are very, very, um, oh, my mind just went blank. They're gr we, have, we have really great students just to brag on them a little bit and working with them is very fruitful. Um, so this is an opportunity as well. Next slide. Um, some of you here may um, be considering this program for yourself, but you also might be in positions where um, you are leading teams where you might be recommending your staff to this program. So I would just like to talk a little bit about what we see as the opportunity for institutions should you support your staff in coming to this program. Um, I already highlighted the networking opportunities for collaboration and it really serves as a nice way to build bridges between university institutions and MIT, which can have a variety of benefits. Um, Certainly as a research focused program, um, we hope to contribute to the professional development and research capabilities of your teams. Um, and we think that there's a lack of information in certain sectors on the quality of Saudi women scholarships. We in this program know that Saudi women are really taking the lead in engineering and working at a very high level and we love it when people learn that through our program. Um, there's a possibility to publish with MIT faculty, new teaching skills and advancement I've hired. These are benefits to the individual fellows, but really benefits to the institutions as well. An institution is the team. And so getting these skills into your teams is a benefit to everyone. Next slide. Um, and then I just wanted to highlight too that we've had fellows visit us from 16 different institutions so far. Um, it is not a requirement that you have a current position at an institution or company in order to um, come to MIT through the Ibn Khaldun Fellowship, but I did want to highlight that a number of institutions have been excited and open to supporting their staff and leaving for this, this opportunity um, to come to MIT. Um, so just to highlight that um, 
the institutions have been very supportive. We're very excited to expand this list and work with new, new universities as well. Next slide. Um, and then finally, um, we were very happy when Vision 2030 was announced and um, with the um, explicit goal of increasing women's participation in the workforce and STEM research and development specifically. I'm very happy to see some of the, um, to already start seeing some of that, the output of that efforts uh, with new opportunities, new initiatives. Um, and we are very honored to be a small piece of that puzzle in bringing this opportunity to more Saudi women. Next slide. And with that, um, I will close my portion and I would like to invite our program assistant Nadia Shahid to continue with our program activities and life at MIT. Thank you so much, Teresa. Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Inshallah, um, all of the attendees and their families remain healthy uh, during these uncertain times. Okay, this one. I'm just going to jump right in here. Our fellows, current and former, engage the MIT community and the uh, broader public and research-related seminars and webinars. It's a great way of following our fellows' research and career progression. Uh, moving on to the next slide. And strengthening uh, the sense of community, events such as our um, Ibn Khaldun reunion, took, which took place in 2018, are expected to resume once life normalizes post-COVID, inshallah. On to the next slide. Another such event was when MIT welcomed uh, Vice Minister Al Ibrahim to a one-day workshop focused on uh, the Kingdom's Vision 2030. 20 plus of our fellows attended, which we considered a great turnout, and generated a wealth of ideas and um, strategies for moving the kingdom forward. On to the next slide. Ensuring our fellows maintain um, a voice and presence post-program completion, we have the Ibn Khaldun Society. Uh, it's currently led by former fellows, Drs. Uh, Sufana al Mahshadi and Halima Al-Amri. Events generated from their efforts include professional training and development, um, encouraging research pursuits, <laughs> webinars, um, and I call your attention to their collaborating to take the MIT uh, hacking medicine to the kingdom in late 2019. So very beneficial to uh, include the fellows even after they complete the program and um, include their voice and their input as our fellowship program continues. Moving on to the next slide. Encouraging unity building, we have programmatic activities such as uh, orientations and presentations. Um, we have Quranic readings, the most recent of which took place during Ramadan 2020. We have luncheons on an individual basis where we get status updates on our fellow and they can express any concerns, as well as group luncheons just for breaking bread and um, increasing camaraderie. Um, this picture on the far right, the large picture, showcases an MIT multicultural event in which our current fellows presented international delicacies and teas to um, attendees. So it's a great way of highlighting the program to the MIT community and integrating the fellows into uh, the broader MIT community as well. This smaller pic picture here is of a 2019 ski trip that uh, the women attended and I was grateful to be able to attend as well. Um, just a way of bonding outside of the lab um, and, and a relaxed atmosphere. On to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, for the fellows who have or will have children uh, join their time with us, Cambridge, Mass, where MIT is located, offers free public uh, school education. And just as a side note, uh, the second term mayor of Cambridge is a Palestinian Muslim woman. So Sambul Siddiqui, Mayor Sambul Siddiqui. So women are making strides all the way around. Um, Cambridge also offers a variety of private schools, 
offerings as well as summer school and after school programs. Um, Eid is also considered a school holiday. So um, that's been the case since 2011. So alhamdulillah for that. And um, there's also um, a campus on MIT's, I mean, a, a child care center on MIT's campus, space permitting. Uh, let's see. So yeah, that pretty much what I've mentioned here is just a snapshot of ways that we inform everyone, current fellows, former fellows, and the general public of the milestones and progression that our fellows make and um, activities that we've built into the program so that we increase that sense of unity and, and bonding. Um, I'll turn the mic over to our, our program administrator, Dorothy Hanna. Dorothy? Thank you very much, Nadia. And now the criteria, if you've been wanting to apply, here's what you need to have. First of all, you must be a woman who is a Saudi Arabian citizen. Probably a lot of you in the audience already fit this criteria. You must have completed your PhD. We have two qualifications by that. Uh, it must be in a related field. And if you're still working on your PhD, you just need to be graduated by September of 2021 to be admitted into the program. But we can work with you if you are finalizing your PhD at this point. And if you completed your PhD more than seven years ago, uh, it's unusual for MIT to take postdocs in that situation, but uh, if you're still interested, we can work with you on a case-by-case -case basis. To succeed at MIT, you must have an excellent command of spoken and written English and have a demonstrated ability to conduct research. MIT is a very hands-on research-focused institution and people who are experienced and interested in that will get the most benefit from their time at MIT. You also must have at least two publications in a peer-reviewed journal to submit with your application. Finally, you need to be working in a field where there is also an MIT faculty member doing their research currently in order for us to match you with a great mentor at MIT. The application is online. You can go to our website, ibk.mit.edu slash application. You will find that the application open today, so you can start your application now. Uh, in addition to filling out all the fields in the application, you will also need to upload your current CV, a letter of recommendation, and a copy of uh, your most significant publication. This is the publication that you think best characterizes your research, and the application will stay open until the end of the day on December 1st. So you've heard what the criteria are, and you're probably thinking, okay, how do I really make my application stand out and make me one of the few who will be accepted? First of all, we need to hear about your past research. What made you really unique? What did you contribute to uh, science or engineering that was a new idea and moved learning forward? Your letter of recommendation should come from someone who really understands your research, who supervised you, and can speak specifically to how you are as a researcher and what your research experience has been like. Additionally, we're going to ask for a plan for the research that you would like to do at MIT. Now, you may think it depends on what professor I matched with and to some extent, yes, um, but we would like to hear what in your ideal scenario you would pursue and what kinds of outcomes you're hoping for. To help us make sure that we can find a really strong match for you with an MIT professor, uh, we're gonna ask you to do some research uh, Go onto the MIT website or look at um, articles by people you respect and find three MIT professors that you think could be a good match for your research. Once all the applications are submitted by December 1st, we will go through a review process, which includes a committee at CATS that reviews the applications and a committee at MIT. 
uh, once we've narrowed it down to a smaller pool of applicants, uh, the top applicants will uh, have video interviews and uh, finally MIT will accept the most qualified candidates. And to give you information about the timeline for this, um, in January, February of 2021, there will be video interviews. Uh, we'll finish by the end of February and by the early March, and in an ideal world by the end of February, but our times are uncertain. Uh, we will share the admission decisions and everybody will get a notification uh, whether you've been accepted or not accepted. You will hear back if you apply about what the decision was. And finally, we will need to have confirmation from accepted candidates um, by June of their mutual accept. So you may be thinking, if I get accepted, how will I get matched with an MIT professor? And you can see that the large cog here says you, the accepted applicant. Uh, you have a lot of agency in this process. We'll begin by sending you a letter of acceptance. And then we will work with an MIT professor, um, one that you think would be a good fit for you, to see if there's space in their lab and if there's a good research fit. Um, and it is a mutual acceptance process between the professor and the applicant. Um, and sometimes people speak with more than one professor depending on how easy it is for them to find a research fit. Uh, but we have had a very high success rate of placing people in great labs. By the end of the process, hopefully in September 2021, you'll be placed in a lab and be able to begin your research at MIT. This is a little bit of uh, advertising for future. Um, we have upcoming webinars, including another webinar on November 18th that will give the same information. And you can check ibk.mit.edu for more information and Zoom links, as well as our Twitter. And I'm going to turn it over now to our fellows. Um, we have a current fellow and a future fellow who will be sharing with us what it was like for them to apply and what their experiences were at MIT. I see that there's a lot of people putting questions in the Q&A, so thank you to everybody. And adding your questions and we will be answering all the questions at the end. So don't give up. We will uh, still be accepting your questions and passing them on to the appropriate person at the end of the webinar. So, I'm introducing the next person. My apologies, I've lost my order. Uh, but I believe we are beginning with Donna. Is that correct? Yes. So uh, Dr. Donna Al-Suleiman is currently an IBK fellow in the Doyle Lab in MIT's Department of Chemical Engineering. So thank you so much, Donna, for being with us here today. And we're excited to hear from you about your experiences. All right, thanks for having me. And thanks for that introduction, Dorothy. Let me just share my slides. All right, so welcome everyone. Thank you all for being here. Um, as Dorothy mentioned, I'm a current IBK fellow. And today I'm gonna to talk to you guys about um, my IBK fellowship journey. And since this is an ongoing journey, I wanted to focus more on my motivations as well as some of my perspectives. So what I have here is actually the first thing my mom told me when I told her that, uh, where I introduced her to the concept of me doing a postdoc. She said, there's something after a PhD. Um, so here I was about a year ago, and some of you girls may remember this day um, when you were no longer a PhD candidate, you were a PhD survivor. And that day when you were no longer you, you're a doctor, you, excuse me. Um, so that day was a really fulfilling day. It was a really fulfilling experience for me and I was really happy as well, up until I hit this sign. 
I didn't know what I wanted to do next. I was at a crossroads. And before I tell you guys how I navigated my way and found my way to the IBK Fellowship and to MIT, I thought I'd give you guys a brief overview about my background. Uh, and this is most efficiently illustrated with a map. So I started off in Jeddah. And at about 14 years of age, I moved to Canada with my older sister to do my high school. And then from there, um, I discovered the field of biomedical engineering. And I found out that the best place to study biomedical engineering in the UK was at Imperial College London. So that's where I went and I did my bachelor's and master's degree. And I managed to secure a full scholarship from the university uh, to continue on and do my PhD. So that's what I did. And finally, I found my way back to uh, North America here at MIT. And that's what I'm gonna talk to you guys about today. So at the end of my PhD, I remember knowing two things. One, I wanted to get out of London, which is very surprising. Um, and the second thing is that uh, I knew I wanted to do something I was really passionate about. You know, something that would get me out of bed, even if it looked like this outside. So in preparing for this talk, um, I reflected back and I realized that it really boiled down to three of my motivations. Number one, I knew I wanted to continue contributing to the field of cancer research, and I wanted to do that at the world class level. Number two, I knew I wanted to further develop myself and grow, and not only as a learner, but also as a teacher, I wanted to contribute to the field of education. And lastly, I knew that I wanted to be heavily involved in promoting women in STEM. So I'm going to talk to you guys about these three motivations and hopefully show you how MIT and particularly this fellowship were so in line with my career goals. So before I talk about my research um, at MIT, I thought I'd give you a brief overview of my research during my PhD. Not to dwell too much, but I was trying to develop, develop um, biosensors to detect cancer at its earliest stages. And that involved trying to detect an emerging class of biomarkers called microRNA. Um, very briefly, they have very important gene regulatory functions, but in cancer patients, their levels get deregulated. The nice thing about them is that we find them circulating in all types of biofluids. So what that means is if we can develop a sensor that's specific and sensitive enough, then we can transform the clinical procedures from the typical invasive tissue biopsy that people typically do to detect cancer and monitor it towards a so-called liquid biopsy. And that was really exciting for me. But where does MIT fit in? Well, obviously, MIT provides us with a plethora of amazing world-class researchers, including my PI, uh, Professor Patrick Doyle. His lab does amazing research on microfluidic and hydrogel-based sensors to detect this microRNA, this biomarker I was talking to you about. And from his lab came a startup, actually, in 2007 called FireFi Bioworks. And this is a really famous um, startup in the field. And just recently, about five years ago, it was acquired by Apcom for $27 million. So I just wanted to show you guys, you know, a brief about how MIT really provides you with the environment to do amazing research, as well as the support to potentially create startups and go into entrepreneurship. But it's also important to mention, as uh, Professor Kamal also mentioned, that the mere geographic location of MIT in Cambridge is really um, is really advantageous, right? It provides you with the opportunity to forge strategic collaborations with our neighboring institutions. So this is uh, Dr. Frank Slack from over at Harvard. And we're actually collaborating with him at this moment in time on a project. Um, and just to put everything into perspective for you guys, remember that microRNA I was talking about? Well, his lab co-discovered the first human microRNA. Any person you, you tell in this field, like who Fra who's Frank Slack, you'll know exactly who he is. So hopefully you guys get an idea about just the magnitude and the significance of the research that's being conducted at MIT on a daily basis. So when I came uh, to deciding, you know, who I wanted to choose as my PI, and that's something really amazing that IBK gives you the opportunity and the freedom to do because you're coming in with your own funding. I wanted to make sure that the lab also has expertise outside of my own. So I did work on these five sensors before, but I wanted to make sure that I have an opportunity to grow. Um, before I get to there, um, I wanted to very briefly mention some of my research to date, um, just to say that if you do have amazing collaborations and communication, then you can also publish. So this paper just got accepted uh, last week. I'm publishing a paper, hopefully, or submitting a paper, hopefully this week. 
This paper got me to, um, actually the abstract of this paper got me to Microtas. Some of you guys may know this is the most famous conference in the field of microfluidics. And finally, I'm working on a, on a third project in progress with Dr. Frank Slack. So yes, as I was mentioning, I wanted to make sure that the lab I choose also has expertise outside of my own. Um, and that's, that would give me the opportunity to grow and develop. And that was one of my motivations. So these are some of the new things I learned from the Doyle lab, including microfluidics, soft photography, and some single molecule studies. But not only was I able to develop my research skills as well as my um, uh, you know, career-based skills, I was also able to develop some transferable skills, for example, through the IAP. IAP is called the Independent Activities Period. It's really famous um, at MIT, and it's a whole month or a semester where MIT basically shuts down all um, courses and all classes and gives students and staff the opportunity to investigate, investigate whatever activities they want, from music to arts to gaming. And I took that opportunity to take some classes to, to develop my career. But not only was I able to contribute as a learner during this period, I also got a chance to be an instructor during one of those IAP um, courses, especially um, uh, the title was Applications of Microfluidics and Chemical Engineering. So that was a really great opportunity. And along with this theme of teaching, uh, Teresa also mentioned and, and Dorothy mentioned this, um, MIT offers this world-class um, program called the Kaufman Teaching Certification Program. And it's built on how you can use research-based and evidence-based strategies to improve your teaching. And I love teaching, that's why I took it. But also because you get a certificate and the letter from MIT um, Vice Chancellor, you also come out of it with a draft syllabus um, of your own course that you can use in your faculty application. So that was really important for me because I just come out of my PhD and I hopefully want to apply for assistant professorship um, in the future. So having this in my hand is, is really strong in an application, I think. But lastly, because of what I learned and all the strategies, my PI, um, Professor Patrick Doyle, he gave me the opportunity to also guest lecture on his grad course. So I thought that was a really amazing opportunity. So things like that do pop up um, when you're in this fellowship. And um, another important thing I learned from the uh, KTCP program is unfortunately the devastating statistics of women in STEM, okay, all over the world. And um, just to highlight this, um, I also learned that um, the main factor, one of the main factors why women in STEM, and particularly women from marginalized groups, you know, women that are not white or Caucasian, why they leave STEM is because they feel like they don't fit in. And I really can attest to, to that from personal experience. That number I've got up there, 12 out of 54, is the number of female faculty members in um, the bioengineering department at Imperial. And it gets even worse at MIT, unfortunately, we're getting there. It's six out of 48 in the chemical engineering department, but our head is, is female, so that's good. So the numbers are, are really low, we are underrepresented and um, I just want to show you some pictures of some of my role models growing up as an undergrad um, and, and as a grad student. They're, they're some of them, or most of them are female. They're all female up here. And I wanted to point out a couple of them. I wanted to point out uh, Professor Rada Muteri. Um, and I wanted to point her out because she is also Saudi and I was ecstatic to know that she was Saudi because I could connect with her not only because of her gender, but also because of her ethnicity. I also wanted to point out Professor Molly Stevens. She is a big name in this field all over the world. Um, but the nice thing about her is that she also did her postdoc at MIT in the chemical engineering department. And I'd always looked up to her and wanted to do things similar to her in terms of her research. And subhanAllah, she ended up being my um, thesis examiner for my PhD thesis. So having these female STEM role models was really empowering for me and inspiring for me. So I wanted to do exactly the same thing for the next generation of, uh, of scientists and engineers. And I really do believe that IBK's objectives um, really do echo mine when it comes to women in STEM. So before I wrap everything up, hopefully you guys have seen how, you know, my career goals really do um, are in line with IBK's careers, uh, IBK's objectives. 
But before I wrap up, it's very important to note that with such a great opportunity, there are always challenges. And our cohort just happens to have had um, the COVID crisis hit in the middle of it. And, um, you know, to say it would be really an understatement to say that it was a time of uncertainty and instability for a lot of us IBK fellows. And I don't think we would have made it through without the amazing support system we had at the, at the IBK and also at MIT. So that brings me really nicely to my acknowledgement section. Obviously, I wanted to acknowledge the funding um, from CACS, but also um, our director, Professor Kamal, who made this experience very welcoming. And also last but certainly not least, you know, you've heard of, from all three of them, Dorothy, Nadia, and Teresa. Um, and thanks to all of them for making this an amazing experience. Um, and as my parting remark to all of you girls, I wanted to tell you guys that, you know, every experience is very unique. And it is what you make of it. And inshallah, you girls will get the opportunity to experience this firsthand. And thank you all for listening. I will end my screen share. Thank you so much, Dana. We really appreciate hearing from you about your experiences. And now I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Sara Alhamoud. She is a former IBK fellow and currently assistant professor of computer science at IMSIU. So thank you very much for joining us today, Dr. Sarah. Thank you so much and I'll be sharing my slides now. Okay, I guess uh, you can see the slides now, yeah? Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, I will be starting by uh, introducing myself, uh, my background, and uh, before uh, starting my 10 minutes uh, presentation, uh, I did my PhD in wireless mobile networks at the University of uh, uh, Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, and then I came back 2011 to work uh, at Imam University, uh, teaching both uh, masters and undergrads. Also at that time, I, I held managerial positions I was the first uh, female uh, uh, vice dean for gifted and excellence uh, deanship. And also I was, after that, after two years of that, I was like the first female vice dean for the IT deanship. Uh, uh, also after that, um, I, I was appointed lastly as the uh, general director of gifted in the Ministry of Education. That was after doing my postdoctoral in MIT. Uh, my postdoctoral was like 2016 I started and then I finished January 2017. My slides are flying. Um, I was also the PI of Arabic Sentiment Analysis uh, Group. Uh, I, I'm interested in um, studying a natural uh, language using artificial intelligence and this is the website of the group. I will be talking about uh, how did it start and uh, the fellowship, what happened and the ecosystem reflection on me and post fellowship. So how did it start? Uh, 2013, I, was, uh, I came across this, uh, this article or this little segment of news uh, and I still remember this picture until today. Uh, I, I was wondering how can I join this, uh, this, uh, this group of uh, uh, ladies to, to get this grant and I was searching for, for the names of uh, the fellows at that time. And I was successful to find uh, the name of one of them. I contacted and asked, uh, how, how can I apply? And she said, well, there is an email that will be circulated every year telling, telling us about this, uh, this grant. So I was waiting and waiting and waiting. And 2014, uh, I didn't get the email. And then 2014, I went to MIT to, to get a course. And I was uh, a tourist then. I, I had like uh, the, the tourist uh, uh, tour on the MIT uh, Media Lab and I saw a C cell and I, I, I was dreaming of uh, being there one day. So um, that was 2014. And I, I, I still remember this hack of MIT. It's a symbolic, uh, it's a symbol of the, the amount of knowledge that MIT uh, gives to, to its students and fellows. Uh, MIT gives a lot and you need to uh, to be ready for that. So uh, this was true when I when I tried uh, when I when I started my fellowship. Summer 2015 I was still searching summer uh, and 2016 I applied. Uh, I, I saw the email and then I applied. 
uh, as uh, as you said, uh, Teresa, the, the 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 process is uh, starting by the interview, uh, filtering, and then acceptance, uh, professor match, and then we do, we do the proposal, and then uh, the uh, I, I guess I can see it um, just yeah the arrival. You arrive at MIT. Uh, this process took uh, longer, and uh, b before before this, uh, and at the MIT side, it doesn't take long. But at the university side, maybe it takes time uh, to get a tisal almi, scientific connection. Uh, some universities may take longer than others. Uh, so uh, I arrived at the uh, Alpha Group with Professor Una May um, at the C Cell uh, Lab, C Computer Science Artificial Intelligence Lab. I guess I was the, the first uh, among the fellow, fellows to, to be uh, at that uh, computer science artificial intelligence lab. Um, uh, yeah, I did two projects. Uh, I was working on two research projects. Uh, the first is Twitter analysis for intelligent transportation, and it was published, alhamdulillah, in the computer uh, journal uh, 2018. And the second one is demographic flow on the metro to be in Riyadh. This is a project uh, to study the capacity of uh, the, the flow and the capacity of uh, people around the metro to decide which, which are the best areas for uh, feeder buses. Uh, we, we did uh, like study it uh, and uh, do simple uh, or this visualization that you see here using CDR or call data records from STC to plot the capacity of people around uh, metro stations. Uh, the 80 or, or 85 metro stations in Riyadh. Uh, this project is still under process and I expect it to be published in 2021. I did several courses. Some of the courses are uh, spanning the whole semester and some of them are only one day course. So uh, yeah, uh, the first one was Big Data Visualization and Society. I was privileged to uh, help in uh, somehow help. I was auditing this course, but I helped because the data is about Riyadh and it had sentiment analysis in it. So I had the privilege to help uh, Professor Sarah, uh, I, I forgot her, her last name. Uh, it will come again. Uh, I did also courses in uh, Harvard because as Professor Kamal said, proximity is, 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 uh, is key in, in Boston. You have like uh, uh, major universities and uh, uh, it, it, is, it is a privilege to be here in, in, in Boston among uh, Harvard and uh, MIT. Uh, I, I also was uh, uh, privileged to, to, to have uh, uh, some training on uh, entrepreneurship and leadership. I did the uh, MIT Sloan Entrepreneurship Development Program and it was uh, a big shift in my, uh, uh, a big shift and an eye opener for me. Uh, I, I also did some courses uh, in, in the lab, so I had this conflict management training and it was crucial. I, I benefited a lot from most of the courses. I was a panel guest speaker in, uh, in the career panel at MIT 2016, uh, the time I was there. Uh, the course that I uh, collaborated in was uh, Big Data Visualization and Society in Riyadh. Uh, and I helped a little bit, not a lot, in, in, in the course because it had sentiment analysis and it, it was about Riyadh. I had also collaborations with Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, uh, it was a collaboration for two years and it uh, finished now. Uh, this collaboration is between Harvard and Saudi Arabia and I, I was involved because uh, I had the connection from this course. Uh, so connection is key in MIT. You connect with great people and um, you have a benefit from that. Ecosystem reflection, uh, the ecosystem was, uh, had a reflection on me. First is the entrepreneurship uh, uh, aspect of it. Second is, of course, is the research uh, I did in, in the lab, professional development classes I took, and art. Yes, uh, something happened when I was in MIT. Uh, I, was, uh, I, I, I started writing my memoir and I hopefully uh, will uh, finish it soon and uh, uh, publish it soon. So, uh, and for, for, for my uh, side activities, I do ski photo uh, photography and bike and write. Uh, I'll share some of my photos if, if you allow me. Uh, those are some of my photos. Boston is so beautiful all the time, even in winter, I like it so much.
I love it so much. And the sunset is, is magical in Boston. Um, yeah, this is winter. I like it. <laughs> Having grocery. Um, okay, so uh, this is uh, the book I, I started writing in 2016 and um, hopefully finish it in, in this coming year. And um, post fellowship, what, what did I do after uh, MIT? Uh, I was appointed as the consultant to the incubator, uh, entrepreneurship incubator in Imam University. And uh, the leader uh, of this course, uh, Professor Bill Ulet, uh, was generous uh, enough to share uh, his content, uh, disciplined entrepreneurship uh, course. So we, we were able to teach it uh, at the university with his help. Uh, and then I, was, uh, I worked as a consultant for a small uh, SMEs in, in Saudi Arabia, in, in Munshaad. Uh, also, I, I was inspired by the intense and uh, boot camp style of MIT, having a lot of information in little time. And we did the research camp uh, for uh, having uh, more than two, 200 participants, and we are continuing to do that. Uh, the first camp, we had like three publications coming out of it. And the camp report, who, for those who are interested, is published in 2020. May 2020 in this uh, journal. Uh, after that, I was uh, uh, appointed as the general director of Gifted in Saudi Arabia, helping to shape the future of our best minds in Saudi Arabia. I was privileged to have this position. Uh, and I want to say thank you. Thank you for everyone who shaped this uh, journey and uh, from Professor Kamal and Teresa, Kate, uh, Dorothy and Nadia and everyone who helped shaping this journey. Thank you so much. Sarah, thank you so much for sharing with us, especially uh, fun to see your beautiful photographs and hear about all you've done since, since you were here with us at MIT. Uh, thank you. So, yeah, it's great to have you. We are going to turn it over now to your questions from the audience. So thank you for everyone who has submitted questions through the question and answer feature. Um, and please go ahead and add more and we'll have questions for all the panelists. So the first one is for Professor Kamal. And it's a question about a book chapter and what kinds of publications you need for your application. So would a book book chapter that is published count as a publication for your application? Yeah, thank you for uh, uh, attending and, uh, you know, for the questions. So uh, I think the requirements, you know, for the application is that uh, you have like two journal papers. Um, additional things, book chapters, books, uh, conference papers, other journal papers, you know, all of those, you know, will help uh, in, in uh, showing the ability of research, you know, of the candidate. So if you have a, uh, so the short answer is that if you have a, a, a book chapter, so you include it in your, uh, in your CV. But it wouldn't count as one of the two um, no. peer reviewed publications. No, it would, it would not, yeah, it would not. Um, and also for Professor Kamal, um, question, do I need to prepare a research plan and uh, should I focus on practical application in the lab or could I also be supervised for a more theoretical type of research? So the, so the second question, whether it's, uh, you know, like mostly practical or mostly analytical or combined, I think that depends on the work that you're doing. We've had uh, people, researchers, students, and so on, you know, who have different uh, interests. Some of them are maybe more interested in the uh, analytical part, and then their work thesis or otherwise would be, you know, directed in that way. Uh, others may be more applied. Um, a lot of the things that we do in my lab, for example, are like a, a combination of the two, the analytical work and then also the, uh, uh, the applied, just because they go... Uh, they go together. As for the research plan, uh, I think a person should have, you know, so at least some idea of what they want to do. And I think in the application, we do 
ask you know, for, for that, not only about the current or the research that the person has done up till now, but also what they envision of doing you know, in, the, uh, in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, can you talk to us about the acceptance rate for the mm -hmm. fellowship? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so last year was the first year where our acceptance rate to the Ibn Khaldun program was actually lower than the MIT undergraduate program. <laughs> so it is a very competitive program. Um, usually we accept five fellows per year. Um, actually, because of COVID, which was a very um, important question for everyone, we've had to reduce that for this coming year in order to budget for expenses that our fellows have incurred due to COVID. So unfortunately, it will be a little tougher next year anyway. But I encourage you not to be discouraged by that, to apply, put yourself out there. Um, you never know what will happen. And I think we, we often don't think, you know, we, um, it, it, um, there's that imposter Room. Don't think that you can't do this. This is something you can do. We want to receive your application. Um, and it's actually even happened where somebody has applied twice or three times and eventually do get into the program because they're continuing to improve themselves over the years. So um, we hope you apply, um, but it, it is a very competitive program with not very many places available. Uh, thanks, Teresa. A uh, question for Donna. Uh, this person thanks you, saying it's a great talk, thank you. And what do you wish you had known or done before becoming a fellow? Um, all right, thank you for that question. And um, thank you for the compliment. Um, so uh, I don't know if I would have changed anything or um, done anything differently. Um, I was just really happy to have heard about the program to start with. So um, what I would have done differently is probably try to get more connected to the different programs available. My situation is quite um, unconventional, unconventional, I would say, because I did my PhD um, abroad, so, so in the UK. So I didn't even know about this program until very, very soon, just before the application process. And I heard about it from an ex-fellow, actually, Dr. Sana Latas, to you guys, Auntie Sana to me, my mom's friend, actually. So <laughs> she told me about the program and I was really glad that I did, you know, talk about this um, and, and, you know, express my interest for, in sciences. Um, and it reached my mom's friend and she told me about it. So that's something I would have slightly done differently, make sure I'm well connected um, to the society and to the academic environment um, in Saudi. Um, in terms of any other prepara preparation, I don't think I would have done anything differently. Um, I learned a lot coming here. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. Thank you. Um, and if you do have more clarifying questions, feel free to put them in our question and answer section. This is a question for Dr. Sara. Um, the question is, what does the proposal entail? And I would also say, like, what about your proposal did you do to make a, a strong proposal for the application? Uh, we, yeah, for the proposal, it's a classical uh, proposal that has like an introduction, uh, abstract introduction uh, and goals. What are you going to do? Those goals need to be like uh, with a timetable. What are you going to do in a timetable? Also, if you're gonna publish any paper, what are you gonna publish? Uh, so uh, details as much as you can. Uh, so this is done in, in, uh, with, with collaboration with your uh, supervis uh, supervisor, yes. And um, yeah, it's, it's a classical proposal document. Uh, I, I, I can answer this question after also. Yeah. May I add to that? Go ahead, Teresa. Yeah. I, I think that maybe there are two pieces that uh, participants have questions about. So in the application, we ask for a research statement um, to talk a little bit about what you would like to do in 500 words. And then I think what Dr. Sara is talking about is that once you're accepted into the program and matched with a faculty advisor, then we ask you and your faculty advisor to put together that detailed proposal so that you have a very strong plan for your time at MIT. And that's where Dr. Sara's advice is very useful. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, this is a three-part question and I'll answer <laughs> the first part. Is this fellowship considered a postdoc? Yes, it is. You need to be a PhD 
and your appointment at MIT will be as a postdoc. Um, second part, um, maybe for uh, Sara, Donna, Teresa, it could be anybody, I guess. Uh, besides research, I want to focus on gaining new research skills, techniques, and experience that will prepare me for both my academic and research career. Um, also take courses, the 10 classes. Will IBK Fellowship allow me to do that? Um, so the short answer is yes, and maybe Sara or Donna, if you have suggestions about what were really meaningful or helpful uh, things for you beyond just the lab work. Um, yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Thank you. Yes, uh, as everyone said, uh, there are a lot of opportunities to, to, uh, to, to gain knowledge from. It's either your immediate lab or collaborations or courses provided uh, through the uh, API, I guess, Dr. Dana. Is it the API, the summer? Yeah, API, uh, it's a yeah. one semester. It is very rich. So uh, the resources are multiple and uh, very rich. So you can grow in research, either with your lab or through the courses or collaborations. I hope I, hope I answered the question. So if you have anything to add. Dr. To add to that, yes. Um, so if you wanted to sit in on actual undergrad or grad level courses at MIT, you can actually do that. But you would sit in as a listener um, rather than, you know, being um, taking it for credit. So you can do that, but you need to approach the PI and send an email of interest um, or get your PI to speak to the other professor who's doing the course. So you can do that, um, but you would be kind of sitting in as a listener, but it's still really um, a good experience. Go ahead, Kamal. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I'd like to add uh, something to this. So I think the, uh, the, you know, the fellows, before they come, you know, uh, when they discuss the research content, uh, you know, with their uh, uh, supervisor, um, the other thing that they will work on is the postdoctoral plan. So MIT requires, in fact, this um, um, uh, postdoctoral plan uh, to be completed before the uh, candidate uh, arrives on campus. And in that plan has all of these um, uh, um, uh, issues that uh, are being talked about. Uh, for example, not only the technical development of the person, but also uh, professional uh, development. And then so the, the candidate or the fellow can list you know, these kind of things. Could be from the teaching, could be the research uh, approach, um, could be even experimental thing. We had some fellows before that did not have, you know, experimental um, uh, uh, experience. And we had planned for them. So they came to campus and then, you know, within like a semester or so, they ended up, you know, making their own things, you know. So, uh, so that one, please, uh, you know, work it out with your supervisor and it goes into your postdoctoral plan uh, development. Thank you. Uh, two related questions. How did the IBK Fellowship overcome the corona pandemic and how did the corona uh, impact uh, working in the lab? So uh, maybe Teresa, you could talk about sure. IBK specifically and maybe Donna, you could talk about what it's been like to work in the lab with corona. Yeah. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, so as I think pretty much any program or institution um, has felt over the last um, six or eight months is that um, we definitely had to go into um, triage mode. Um, our community on, at MIT was scattered. Um, labs were closed. Nobody was allowed to work for an undefined amount of time. Um, so we recognize that all of our fellows, regardless of how long they had been on campus, we're losing about three months of active lab work. Um, and so what we did is we did a lot of rejiggering of our budget. <laughs> Sorry for the jargon. We had a lot of re rethinking of our budgeting to facilitate our fellows who are on campus to receive extensions to their program. Um, so all of the fellows that were on campus were extended in their program for an additional six months. Um, it is actually very very rare for us to do extensions. So I do not want to set an, on, uh, uh, an expectation that we cannot meet. Um, this is very unusual um, and came at significant 
costs and that we will not be able to take our usual number of fellows yet like next year and the extensions had lower benefits than we were able to offer for a typical year. So it has been a lot of adjusting. Um, but the fellows who are on campus, um, we believe have been able to recover the time that they've lost um, due to COVID. Um, and the fellows who we were originally expecting to welcome to campus in September are all still planning to come to MIT um, delayed. So some will be starting in February, um, some for their own needs are starting in September, but inshallah, everyone will still be able to do their program um, and, um, you know, we've managed to make do um, with, uh, yeah, I guess I'll leave it there. Um, so far, all everyone's program is proceeding um, and thriving. Yeah, if you want me to add to that, because my research is um, very lab based, I did have to stop my research for three months. During that time, I tried to take um, courses online as well as do a lot of my data analysis and so on. But I did have a, a significant chunk of my time um, outside of lab. It did kind of slow things down. But as soon as I got back, I just wanted to say that MIT is managing this uh, crisis quite well, I would say really well. So we are functional, we are going into labs. Um, I'm getting more hours than I need in the lab. And just to say a general idea of how things are running, every three days you have to go and get a COVID test. Waiting in line is about 10 minutes, so it doesn't take up too much of your time. You need to do a health attestation every single morning. And the hours, um, I guess, on campus are pretty much the same, but you need to make sure that there's a, a lower number of people in the lab at the same time, but it's quite manageable because our labs are quite big as well. So it's functional, it's manageable. I don't feel like my research is being impacted during this time. Yeah. Thank you. Um, probably a question for Professor Kamal. Is there criteria for the letter of recommendation and more generally, what makes a strong letter of recommendation? The, uh, I think the strong uh, letter of recommendation is a recommendation that comes from uh, a person who has worked with the fellow before and uh, and uh, and the letter would point you know to the research that was done and you know some of the important things uh, uh, not only for the, the research and how the fellow thinks and approaches uh, problems problem solving you know this kind of thing so if the if the letter comes let's say from the president of a university and the president of the university has never worked, uh, you know, with the fellow, you know, then that letter, you know, will not have any weight uh, to it, right? It comes from an important person, but it will not have any weight because there was no uh, significant connection, you know, with the, uh, with the fellow. So, so the letters, you know, that come from people who have worked with you and they can uh, speak about the work that you have done, the work that, uh, how you did the work, the ideas and all of that. Yes. Thank you. So now a multi-part question and I'll answer the first two questions. Um, is the start date of the program fixed or flexible? Um, it's flexible, although we prefer to have people start in September because we think it's the most effective for uh, using their one year at MIT. Uh, but it is flexible depending on your situation. And will the COVID situation affect the upcoming fellows? Um, we think that fellows will be able to come to MIT and work in the lab in September 2021, although of course we don't know for sure. Um, next part of this question is, uh, does CACS get involved in the selection process? And the answer is yes. And uh, Dr. Malak, I don't know if you would like to contribute to this. Um, answering this question, if you have any comments on that or not. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Dorothy. It, uh, CACs basically do the uh, primary screening of the candidate and selecting uh, uh, from many uh, uh, research scientists here in CACs, multiple ones, so it goes through multiple uh, in the committee and uh, they, each uh, applicant need, uh, get a scores and then uh, we uh, send uh, the best scored uh, uh, application to MIT to, and then it takes from there to the MIT. So MIT 
actually make the final call, not CACs. Thank you. Uh, two more uh, questions. Can the fellowship be extended? Uh, yes, but it's not very common. Um, and for example, the COVID-19 pandemic is the reason it got extended. So something very unusual in general. Um, and uh, what type of visa status? Uh, if the fellow is coming from a US university, we could uh, take a fellow with OPT. In general, we appoint fellows with a J-1 visa, but that we will work out with you once, once you're accepted. Uh, let's see. I'm looking through questions and seeing ones we haven't already answered. Um, I think most of them have been answered in one form or another. Uh, a lot of questions about the fellowship being one year. The research proposal is for one year. Uh, there's a question uh, that I didn't fully understand. So if you added this question and are still unsure, you could write another question to clarify for us about uh, coming from a Saudi university mm -hmm. and what sponsorship is like. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how we would answer that. I, or I, just from my experience, I can guess a little bit at some of it. So I can provide some information. And if that, and if that is not clarifying, maybe um, we can ask a follow-up question. Um, so the process for um, receiving approval from a university to come to MIT varies somewhat from university to, to university. Um, the way that MIT typically gets involved is um, by providing supporting documentation. Um, so oftentimes those processes will re require a variety of re internal reviews. Um, and that there's a, a set process for requesting a leave of absence to come to MIT. Um, typically what we will do is if you are at a current university and we have a former fellow who has gone through the process, that person can be a very good resource for you. Um, so for instance, if you're at Imam Abdul Rahman University, I might say, Sara, can you please help them, you know, understand the process a little bit better. Um, so our former fellows are a resource if you happen to be at a university who's hosted a fellow before. Um, and we can definitely provide um, any supporting letters or documentation needed. Um, we have a standard um, acceptance letter that we send that typically meets the needs of those committees as far as providing information, but Dorothy and Nadia can modify that um, as needed to fit the needs of your university. Um, thank you very much, Teresa. And um, oh, there we go. Uh, I know we've reached the end of our allotted time and some of our uh, panelists um, need to go on to other things. We will stay online for a few more minutes if you have additional questions. But I want to thank um, Dr. Malak from CAXT and uh, Dr. Dana and Dr. Sara for speaking with us and Professor Kamal for being here as well. So uh, thank you to all of you as well, of course, Teresa and Nadia. And thank you to all the participants. And we really look forward to uh, hearing from you and answering your questions via our email address, ibk at mit.edu, um, or reading your applications. So thank you all for taking the time to join us this evening. Mm -hmm. um, while everybody's um, dispersing, there was a question in the chat about whether or not participants or applicants need to reach out to faculty prior to applying. So maybe I can just address that briefly. Um, Great, so you. we ask that applicants put together a list of faculty that they see are working in their research area, but you do not need to reach out to faculty prior to applying. Um, if you're accepted into the program, we use that list as a starting point to facilitate conversations with faculty that are aligned with your research. Um, so if when you're accepted, Dorothy works with you to set up conversations with faculty of interest to you. So that list of three faculty is the starting point. Maybe you'll have find, found others in the meantime, um, but we work with you to, do, to initiate that process of reaching out to faculty. Um, you do not need to do it in advance. If by chance you happen to have a relationship with a faculty member at MIT that you know you would like to work with, 
do let us know. Um, we're very happy to have this fellowship serve to further a relationship you already have, but it is not a requirement to apply. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, I don't see any more questions, uh, but uh, please do send us your questions. And uh, thank you again to all and, the panelists. And your applications. And your applications, <laughs> yes. <laughs>